Hi, my name is Steve Montgomery, and I'm an IoT specialist with Digital Six Laboratories. In this short video, I'm going to take you on a quick walkthrough of FoodSafe.io version 2.0, our digital food safety checklist application. To start the FoodSafe.io application, simply tap on the icon on your tablet. Once the application is loaded, you will be presented with the home screen. FoodSafe.io is fully integrated with our restaurant IoT digital food safety solution and the home page has all the information that you need to know the digital food safety status of your restaurant. The status bar is located at the top of the application and it indicates the version of FoodSafe.io, the location name, and then it has four status icons that indicate whether a user is logged in, if the Bluetooth temperature probe is connected, whether internet is available, and the relative quality of the internet. The home page is divided into four quadrants. The checklist quadrant tells you how you're doing on checklists for the day. It indicates how many checklists are due now, how many are overdue, and how many are not due or optional. The analytics quadrant shows you the status of checklist completion, including how many you've completed, what your completion rate is for the day, and your on-time completion rate. The hand wash quadrant is available to customers that are using our Smart Soap hand wash compliance monitoring technology. If you are not using Smart Soap at your location, this quadrant will be grayed out. If you are using it, it will show you how you're doing on hand wash compliance throughout the day. The blue line indicates the target that you need to reach each hour, and the individual bars show you how you're performing in that hour to the target. If the bar is red, you miss the target. If the bar is green, you made the target. And finally, the cold storage quadrant is available to customers that are using our refrigerator and freezer real-time monitoring technology in their restaurants. If you're not using our sensors in your restaurants, this quadrant will be grayed out. But if you do have our sensors monitoring your refrigerators and freezers, this quadrant will be available. The good circle indicates how many of your refrigerators and freezers are at proper temperature. If you have any that are not at proper temperature, that will be indicated by the alert circle and the snooze circle indicates how many of your refrigerators and freezers are in the snooze status. Equipment that is either offline because it's not being used at this time or is in maintenance would normally have the alert snoozed and those refrigerators and freezers would be counted in the snooze circle. All of the functions of the FoodSafe.io mobile application are accessed through the main menu. The main menu is activated by pressing on the center circle icon. This will open up the main menu. To use most of the functions in the application, you need to be logged in as a user with the appropriate permissions. To log in, press the user icon, select your user, and enter your password. You will now notice that the user icon indicates that a user is logged in on the status bar at the top and the status bar also indicates the name of the logged in user. Going clockwise around the menu, the other menu options are configuration, database refresh, checklist editor, report generator, and cold storage monitoring. In the rest of the video, we will go over each of these options in detail. Let's start with configuration. Press the gear icon to open the configuration menu. The configuration menu gives you the ability to change app permissions, edit checklist definitions and reports, configure your temperature probe, change the quality and auto stabilization mode, configure the employee timeout parameters, and determine how long we will retain data in the app. And it also gives you the ability to edit the roles and employees. Roles are used to control permissions for all of the functions of the checklist application, including the features of the app, individual checklists, and individual reports. To edit roles, click the Roles button. When we initially set up your account and your data set, you will have four roles by default, employee, DFS report role, food safety role, and manager role. The DFS report role is a role that's assigned to all the reports and that any employee that has that role attached to them will receive the food safety reports by email when they're generated. 
The food safety role is by default assigned to any food safety checklist and that would be given to employees that are qualified to complete food safety. Manager role is self-explanatory as is employee. You could create your own roles and modify the way the permissions are set up in the application if you want to. To edit an existing role, simply click on the role and an editor will come up that will allow you to change the name and the permission level. Permission levels are relative, so you should give higher permission levels to more advanced roles that are capable of doing more things. Once you've made your changes, click Save to continue. To create a new role, press the New button, and again, enter a name that makes sense and assign a permission level, and click Save to continue. Once your roles are set up, you need to make sure that all of your employees for the location are entered into the system. By default, when we set up your initial data set, we create a default manager employee, but you'll need to add the individual employees that you want to be able to use the app. To do this, press the Employee button. Just as with roles, the employees are listed and you could create a new employee by pressing the new button or you can edit an employee by pressing on the employee and the employee editor will come up. You can change the employee's name, you can give them a number. Uh, we need the cell phone number and the email if you want this employee to be able to receive text message alerts when something goes wrong at the location or if you want them to be able to receive the reports via email. They also need a password and you need to assign the roles. These roles are what you defined in the previous step. So if you had seven roles, seven would be available and all you have to do to assign a role is click on it. If a role is assigned, there's a check mark beside it. If it's not assigned, then there's not a check mark. Once you've made your changes to the employee, click Save to continue. With your roles assigned, you may now want to edit your app permissions. We set these app permissions up by default so that the manager can do almost everything. But you can change these to any role you want for each of these different types of permissions. Make the changes you want and click Save to continue. Editing checklist definitions gives you the ability to change certain things about a checklist from within the app. We also have a full checklist editor that's available at our Whisker.io portal application that lets you do things like edit checklist steps, change the names of equipment, and things like that. But from inside the app, you can make checklists active, you can change the schedule, those types of things. When a checklist is gray in this list, it means that the checklist is not active. Many times you have menu items that are seasonal, and so when they're not in season, you want to make sure that they're inactive so that you're not being asked to do those menu items throughout the day. So for example, right now, 4 to 1 fresh beef is active because it's green. We could make that inactive by clicking on it and going down to the schedule and setting it to inactive and hitting save. That makes that inactive and now that checklist is not required every day. If we have an inactive checklist or an inactive menu item that we want to put back on the menu so that it gets tested every day, we would do the same thing. Select it again, go and set the schedule to daily. And if the schedule is set to daily, that means that checklist has to be done every day. The valid start and end times determine the period that it has to be completed in, and the employee role determines which role an employee has to have assigned to be able to do the checklist. If this were a checklist that you wanted to make available for your employees, but it was not required every day, you could change the schedule to on demand. When you're done editing the checklist, you can just hit the back button and then I'll take you right back to the menu. The temperature probe gives you the ability, if you hit that button, it lets you reconfigure your temperature probe. You should have done that when you did the initial setup of the application, but if your temperature probe breaks and you have to get a new one, it needs to be reconnected to the tablet, you would use the temperature probe button to do that. Quality mode determines how we're going to handle quality failures in the food safety application. So there's a couple of ways that we can do that. We can ask the user, and what that means is that when a food safety temperature, when we're testing a temperature for food safety and food quality, if it falls outside the quality band, we can ask the user, do you want to fail on quality, which means it would force the test to restart. We can force it to fail on quality, or we could ignore quality failures. Now, quality failures are still recorded in the report. It's just that we wouldn't require the test to be redone. Most of the time, people leave this on Ask User, and that leaves it up to the manager whether they want to repeat or test or not for food quality failure. 
auto stabilization turns on the auto stabilization feature and what that means is that when you're taking temperatures with your Bluetooth probe normally if auto stabilization is off you have to push the button on the probe to record a temperature if you turn auto stabilization on the app will detect when the temperature rises and stabilizes once the probe tip is in the product that's being sampled and it'll automatically grab the temperature we recommend that you leave auto stabilization off because this gives more accurate results. Employee timeout controls how long an employee has to be inactive on the app before they're automatically logged out and it's defaulted to 10 minutes. Data retention determines how many days worth of data we keep on the app uh, for the checklist that you're recording. Now all of your data is stored in the cloud but the part that we keep on the tablet is limited to a maximum of 90 days. We recommend that you actually set that to 30 days. If the tablet is not connected to the internet the data will be retained on the tablet but it won't be mirrored to the cloud. So make sure that at least part of every day the tablet has internet connection. It's not required to complete food safety but it is required for the data to mirror up to the cloud so that you have access to the reports and the digital food safety executive dashboard at the Whisker IO web portal. And that's all there is to the configuration menu. Now before we move on I want to point out that when a user is logged in you can also log the user out and all you have to do is push the user button again and it'll ask you if you want to log out the user. Click yes and the user will log out and you'll notice that the top bar now indicates that there's no logged in user and the name of the logged in user disappears. The employee login window pops up again. The next item on the main menu is the data refresh icon. When you click this, it will ask you if you want to refresh the data. Anytime you edit your checklist definitions in the cloud, you need to pull those down to the tablet so that it has the updated checklist definitions. This is the way that you would do that. So if you want to update your data, make sure you click proceed. Now, this warning is indicating that we have data that hasn't been yet mirrored to the cloud. So that means that we've completed checklists on the tablet app, but that data hasn't been mirrored to the cloud yet. If we go ahead and proceed with the mirroring operation now, we would lose that data. So I'm going to hit cancel. But you would normally go ahead and hit proceed if you wanted to pull down the new checklist definitions. If you find that you need to pull the new checklist definitions down and you have unmirrored data, make sure that you let the tablet set for 10 or 15 minutes while it's connected to the internet and there's no employee logged in because the data will only mirror as long as there's no employee logged in and it has good internet connection. The next item on the menu is the checklist editor. When we click that, we get a Kanban view of our checklists that have to be completed for today. And there's five columns. Any checklists that have a daily schedule are going to either be in the overdue, in progress, due now, or complete columns. Or if they're not due yet, they're going to be in the not due column. If you have checklists that are optional, in other words, they don't have to, they have the on-demand schedule and they don't have to be done every day, they're always going to be in the purple not due optional catalog, uh, column. Items that are in the overdue column mean that these checklists are late. Normally you want to try and manage your digital food safety checklist so that you never have anything in the overdue column. It should always either be in due now, not due, in progress, or complete. To start a checklist, all you have to do is click on it. You can also slide the checklist to the right and it'll bring up a special hidden menu. The first button gives you the ability to bring up the checklist editor, which we've already talked about. The second option gives you the ability to do a manual checklist. This is something that you would do if, for example, for some reason your tablet was damaged and you had to get a new one and there were a couple of days that you couldn't get your food safety done. You can manually enter food safety data. Or you could manually edit data from a previous day if there was a problem with the checklist. Any data that's manually entered instead of automatically captured from the Bluetooth uh, thermometer or from one of our temperature sensors is going to be marked on the report as manual so there's no way for pencil whipping or dry labbing to happen without it being immediately obvious to anyone that looks at the reports. So let's go ahead and start a checklist and see how this works. For 
cooked food items, in other words, items that are either cooked in a fryer or an egg cooker or an oven or on a grill, when you start those checklists, it's going to ask you what cook surfaces you want to cook those on, and you could select up to nine. There are a minimum number of cook surfaces or platen count. You can specify that when you edit the checklist. You can say, I want it to be cooked on at least one cook surface or two or three or four or whatever. Whatever the minimum number is, you have to select that number here. So let's say I have to do at least one surface of breakfast steak, but I'm going to do um, two, and I'm going to do it on one and five. If you notice, the number one was already selected. That's because it remembers your default selection for the cook surface. When you change that default, it's going to ask you, do you want to update that? So now this is going to become the new default. I'm going to say yes. And that way, the next time this starts, it's going to ask me uh, for the uh, cook surfaces, but it's going to default to 1 and 5. Now, the reason the Add Note button popped up is because we made a change. So it gives us the option of adding a note to the system. And notes are a very important part of foodsafe.io because they give you the ability to document corrective actions and any other changes or information that you need to record as you're completing checklists. And that data or those notes are added to the reports when you print them so you have full documentation of what happened. Now I'm gonna not I'm gonna choose not to put a note in for that change right now. So in this case the first thing that I'm asked is what is the run size? And then I'm gonna get asked what is the cook time? Now this is a standard cooked food checklist. And generally we always ask what the run size and cook time is before we start asking for temperature samples. When you change either one of those numbers, it will remember the default answer that you've given. So the next time this checklist is run, it'll automatically fill in the previous answer that you gave. So as these things change from day to day, you won't have to constantly enter a new number. Now once you get to actual temperature samples, it can either draw temperature samples from the Bluetooth temperature probe, which if you're doing cooked food, that's almost always the way you're going to do it. But if this were asking for a sample, a temperature sample from a refrigerator, for example, it could also pull it from a temperature sensor uh, that was uh, put in that refrigerator or freezer uh, if you were using the sensors in the refrigerators or freezers. So it gives you both options. You'll notice that the answer is has a green backing. That means that this is both inside the digital food safety and the digital food quality uh, band. So if I were to increase or decrease the temperature so that this food was not safe anymore, in other words, it's below 155, you'll notice that it goes red. That tells you that you're going to fail on food safety if you record that temperature. So if I push the button right now and record a temperature, it's going to pop up and say that that's a food safety failure. Now, it gives you the option of redoing the sample because sometimes, especially when people are learning food safety uh, with foodsafe.io, in the beginning, they push the button too early. So if you did do that and you didn't get a valid sample, just hit redo and then adjust your probe so that you're getting the right temperature. And once the temperature is in the correct band, press the button and record it again. And then you just do the same for the rest of the samples. When you're done with Cook Surface 1, it automatically advances you to Cook Surface 5 and asks you the same questions. So we're going to answer these real quick. But let's say that for some reason I noticed that there was a problem when I'm taking um, a, a temperature sample off of this platen and I wanted to add a note. So I could push the note button and that brings up the note dialog and that gives me an opportunity to add a note to this step. And so we're just going to record that the platen hinge looks broken. And we'll record that note. And now when we answer that question, that note is actually attached to that answer and it will show up on the report and we'll see how that works in a minute. You'll notice that it also automatically advances. So every time you complete a question, it, it, you give a question and answer, it automatically advances to the next uh, question. Once you have them all complete, it actually is going to move that from in progress to complete, and now that checklist is complete. So if we go back to the main menu, and now we go to the report icon, 
we can actually run our daily food safety report. And the exact reports that are available will depend on what your brand is and what reports you need. For McDonald's, for example, the food safety report is something that has to be run every day. So we can click that button and run that report. And you'll notice that when this comes up, the report looks exactly like the paper report that's corporate approved. And we can actually see the results of our breakfast steak test there. Now, when you run a report, you have the option of emailing it. When you hit email, it takes that report and it emails it to every one of the employees that have the report uh, email role assigned to them. You can also, if you want to print to a local printer, you can also hit the print button and that will bring up the print dialog and that will allow you to print the report uh, to a local printer. Once you have all of the checklists completed that are required for this report, the Approve button will become active and you can click on that. That gives managers the ability to go in and sign the report to say that they, to digitally sign it and say that they've read the report and approved it. And once that's done, the entire food safety process is done for the day. So in other words, once you've completed all your daily food safety checklists and you've completed your report and approved it, food safety is complete for the day. Now you'll notice that the reports have color-coded uh, boxes beside them. The food safety report is red because it's overdue, meaning that the, the report should have been completed by now, but it's not complete. If it was green, that means that it's complete, but it's not approved. Once it's complete and it's been approved, it would be blue. Now there's a couple more things I want to point out on the report screen. Um, you can not only run the report for today, so the report date is always defaulted to today, but if you need to run a report for a previous day, you can actually select a different day. So let's go back a couple of days and we can um, run a report for that day and that will actually pull the checklist data for that day and regenerate the report. Now the other thing I'll point out is that you'll notice on this day, this second page has nothing on it for notes. That's because no notes were entered on that day. But if we rerun that report for today, where we did enter notes, then we should see the note about our broken hinge, and there it is. And it shows that breakfast steak, step number three, the platen hinge is broken. So that's the way that we record corrective actions uh, and any other information that we need to record as we're completing food safety checklists. The last thing I want to show you is um, the, the skip step functionality. So when we run a, a checklist, like let's pull up the startup checklist, if for some reason I can't complete a step because a piece of equipment is broken or not available or whatever, you don't actually have to record a temperature for it. You can hit skip. And when you do that, it will actually skip that step. It will record as skipped on the report and um, that will let you complete the checklist. You, can all, you should always add a note to a step when you skip it, and that way there's documentation explaining why that skip was stepped. This is usually done like on the startup checklist or on a temperature log checklist where you have to check maybe 10 or 15 refrigerator temperatures and one refrigerator is broken so it's not available to take that temperature. You would skip the step in that case. And so now that we've skipped it, that step is marked as skipped. So when we go back now and we rerun the report, we should be able to look at that part of the report and see that the skip was the step was skipped. And sure enough, up here in that question, it shows that there is an S by the um, by the step. That means that it was skipped. And so that's how we document that. The last thing I want to show you is the cold storage monitoring screen. To access that, open the menu and select the last menu option. When you bring this up, it's going to show a gauge for every refrigerator or freezer that we're monitoring with our temperature sensors. These are color coded, so if the band that's going around the gauge is green, that means that it's inside of the safety band and the food is okay in that refrigerator. In other words, it's inside its temperature range. If it's red, it means that there is an alert on that refrigerator. And if it's blue, it means that refrigerator is snoozed. And you can filter and just look at which, which ones are in alert status by clicking in alert. 
And in this case, there's none that are in alert status, so we're not seeing any. And then the same thing with this snooze. That gives you the ability to look at it really quickly. When you have a lot of refrigerators, let's say you had 20 refrigerators in your restaurant and one of them was in alert, you could go to the in alert filter and that would bring that one refrigerator up very quickly. Now, if you want to look at the historical data, so you want to look at graphs and historical data for these refrigerators, you would need to log into your account at www.whisker.io and go to this location in the particular refrigerator and look at the device snapshot view. And that's a brief walkthrough of the foodsafe.io version 2 digital food safety checklist application. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video and if you have any questions at all please contact your customer success manager because they want to help you be successful with this application.